Howdy. Welcome back to the Papal Zouave International Podcast. Uh, I'm Brandon Cassell, the founder of Papal Zouave International, an organization dedicated to promoting and preserving the history of the Papal Zouaves. They're a unit of brave Catholic soldiers who came from across Christendom to defend Blessed Pope Pius IX during the Ninth Crusade. With me here today is Father uh, Schofield. Is that the proper way to say it? No, Schofield. Schofield. Yeah. Father yeah. Schofield. Uh, he's the author of the book Victorian Crusaders. So the, uh, he wrote a book about the British and Irish volunteers in the Papal Army in 1860, the 1870. So during the time of the Ninth Crusade. Uh, so, Father, if you want to go through uh, introduction to yourself and uh, about the book and why you wrote it. Absolutely. Well, hello, everyone. Lovely to uh, be with you this evening, as it is in London. But I think for many of you, it's it's afternoon. Um, I'm sitting in my presbytery in Uxbridge, which is just north of London Heathrow Airport. Um, Uxbridge is famous for two things. Firstly, the Battle of Britain was commanded from Uxbridge in a big bunker, which you can visit as a museum. In, back in 1940. Uh, and more recently, our Member of Parliament was somebody called Boris Johnson, who you might have heard of. Um, but otherwise, it's just one of the many suburbs at the edge of, of London. And I'm the parish priest here. Uh, I also work as the archivist for the Diocese of Westminster. Um, so we look after some very valuable papers relating to English Catholic history, although sadly not a huge amount about the Zouaves in them. Um, I also teach at the uh, local seminary, uh, a course on church history from the French Revolution uh, onwards. Um, and it's great to be with you. Um, I've just had our evening mass. And before that, I had a class with 52 children. So I'll try and kind of move my brain into uh, the Zouave subject uh, and talk to you about the book that I wrote. It, it was in many ways my my lockdown project. Um, many of us had a, had a bit of extra time in lockdown. And for many, many years, I wanted to write a book about the, the Zouaves. And the way I came across the Zouaves was when I was back in seminary. I, I was lucky enough to go to the venerable English College in Rome, uh, which is the English and Welsh College in the Eternal City. Um, in fact, it's the oldest English institution overseas, still in existence. It goes back to 1362, when a hospice for English pilgrims was founded there. And then in the 1570s, it was transformed into a seminary um, through the work of the great uh, William Allen. Um, and at the back of the chapel in the college is this monument to Julian Watts Russell, one of the English Zouaves. He's not buried there, um, but it was a monument that used to be on the battlefield of Mentana. And it was moved, um, I think, in the 1880s or 90s to the English College Chapel, partly just for, for safety. Um, and I remember passing it every day several times and, you know, gradually learning about Julian Watts Russell. And I was kind of really surprised that a, a teenager, a 17 year old English boy had shed his blood for the Holy See, not in the Middle Ages, not not as part of the Crusades, but as recently as 1867. Uh, and that kind of made me curious to to find out a bit more. Of course, back in the in the dark ages of the, the 1990s, when I didn't have Internet or anything, it was quite hard to find out much information about the Zouaves, especially in English. But I always kind of wanted to, to find out more and perhaps write a book. I thought there was a, a story um, worth telling. And then many years later, that wonderful book by Charles Coulomb, The uh, Pope's Legion, was, was published. And I thought, fantastic. At last, there's something in English about the Zouaves, but you know we need a bit more detail perhaps on the English and Welsh and Scottish and Irish uh, dimension. Um, and so I began uh, doing a bit of research in spare moments. And then I'm sure some of you are familiar with that wonderful series of books published by Osprey, the, the Men at Arms series. And there were two volumes of books on, on the armies of the Italian unification that came out um, with a good section on the Zouaves. And that also kind of encouraged me to to find out more. And um, the two wonderful uh, resources I used, firstly, were online newspapers from the 19th century. They're, they're absolutely valuable. And I'm sure in America and elsewhere, you can access them. You know, you, you put in a keyword like Zouave or Mentana, and you get so many references, which, you know, 10 years ago, even would have been really hard to find. You'd have to go to libraries and turn every page individually and, and, and find a reference. But now it's so easy um, with our digital resources. So I got a lot of info from, from that, from letters of Zouaves and, and articles about the Zouaves 
published in the various newspapers. And the other wonderful thing was the various um, online translation tools. You know, I could buy books in French and Italian and languages I don't speak very well. And then it takes a bit of time, but, you know, page by page, uh, translate them and get a lot of useful uh, information. So that was really useful uh, in publishing and researching my book. But, you know, the challenge is, Brendan, it's really hard to find original archives relating to the English speaking Zouaves. Um, I mean, I, I, I direct the one of the main Catholic archives in England uh, at Westminster, uh, all the papers of the archbishops of Westminster and, and other Catholic bodies, almost nothing that I could find about the Zouaves in them. You know, that the bishops weren't always directly involved. It was very much a movement to do with the laity and, and from the kind of ground up. And I guess most archives will be kept in with the family. You know, I'm sure there are attics around the country even now where there are kind of albums and, and diaries which haven't yet been discovered, but which are, are waiting for us to, to look at. It, it's so sad to think, though, that that's the case, but it really is. Um, we were talking beforehand, uh, Cardinal Manning, who was the Bishop of Westminster at the around the time period, he wrote an introduction to um, a biography translated from French into English on Joseph Louis Guerin. Um, mm -hmm. If you recall us uh, talking about it in an earlier podcast, he was um, the closest Zouave to sainthood. There was many intercessions associated with him and he had a packet put together but that whole book is tr the translated version of english is lost the french is there but the english one is just nowhere to be found it's it's really crazy to um to think about that mm -hmm. i i would love to get a hold of that and republish it um another thing too um uh, really the memory of the, of the Zouaves is just not as strong as, you know, we would hope it to be. I was mm -hmm. uh, in Lourdes. Um, I had the privilege of going to Lourdes uh, last May with uh, the military pilgrimage they had there. Mm -hmm. And I had the chance to meet the uh, bishop of the Archdiocese of the Military for England. And I told him about the papal Zouaves and the martyrdom of Julian Watts Russell. And he had he had no idea. And But he was really pleased to, to learn about it, though. Yeah, I mean, two, two things quickly. But firstly, um, Sadly, that a lot of the archive of Cardinal Manning, who became Archbishop in 1865, so in the, in the very heart of this whole uh, period, um, a lot of his papers went missing um, over the years, or they were um, destroyed by flood or fire, or they were borrowed by researchers kind of in the 1930s and never kind of returned, and who knows where they are now. So although we have um, about, I don't know, 20 boxes of Manning material, it's very random what, what's been preserved and what hasn't. And there's very little to do with the, the Zouaves. His predecessor, Cardinal Wiseman, who was um, Archbishop up until 1865, we have a lot of his papers, but I, I couldn't find anything um, about the Zouaves. But there is a wider issue, uh, Brendan, about the memory of the of the Zouaves. You know, if you go to Rome, you really have to know where to look to find any any monument to them or any reference to them. Obviously, the Campo Verano Cemetery, uh, churches like like San Luigi. There's a monument in, in the Lateran Basilica, um, but it, the whole memory is very low key, I guess, partly because uh, in the eyes of the world, it was the losing side. And, you know, it's, it's the victors who often have the control over memories and, and, and monuments. Um, and here in England, I mean, obviously, that there's no monument to the Zouaves. There were no, uh, as we'll discuss later, no veteran associations as such. But I have seen a few individual gravestones of Zouaves, and they're very proud in saying um, their name and then the letters ZP um, after their name or X Zouave Pontifical or, or, or whatever um, wording they, they choose. So um, even though this happened many decades before in their youth, they were very proud of it. It, it was almost their identity. Um, that, that some of, I think our last Zouaves died in the 1930s in this country but they still identified as ex pontifical Zouar. Something that I would love to produce one day, it might be a while, but it would be a resource on um, different Zouave monuments and mm -hmm. um, important locations around Rome. Um, what I, it was really crazy to think. I was in Rome in, uh, it was 2020. I was in Rome in October, 2020, 
and I was in St. John Lateran. And this, so this is before the idea of, of the organization. I was still very into it, the Zwaves and everything, but I, I hadn't come to the conclusion to do that yet. So my me- knowledge wasn't there. Um, I was in the Eucharistic Chapel in St. John Ladder, and that's where that monument dedicated to the Bastel, Battle of Castel Fidardo is. Mm-hmm. And I was right next to it. I had no idea. Yeah. And it's huge. Yeah. You can't miss it. This isn't yeah. something t- tiny for those who it, – it's like the size of a wall. It's mm-hmm. huge. But um, anyway, one more thing before we move on. You mentioned the translated works. Mm-hmm. It is, it is uh, so much easier, like you mentioned – to understand and learn and research about this wasp today because of that. Uh, and that's part of the only reason I've been successful in this endeavor for Papal Zwaab International is because I have the ability to, to just search a term and all of a sudden I have all this material come up. And I uh, it's not without – the people who came before me really deserve a lot of credit because there's a lot of blogs from the early 2010s, sometimes mm-hmm. even earlier, that – kind of i'm building up on their backs and um you know if i could give them credit i would it's just like a lot of these blogs just Mm -hmm. you know they they don't work on them anymore or there was even one the other day that just went offline because the website was so old so Mm -hmm. um but anyway the the material is there it's just for us to grasp it and comb through it and really just bring it to to the people but Mm -hmm. um anyway father now let's get into the the book a little bit um, so what can you tell me about the, the sentiments of Italian unification, both pro and con in the Britain and Ireland leading up to 1860? Well, I mean, I think that the really interesting thing about the um, English response to the whole defense of the temporal power is the fact that England or Britain, it was always confusing to say whether to say Britain or England, um, it was really a hub of um, support for Italian unification. It was a huge um crusade from the liberal point of view a lot of english people supported the resurgimento um in fact it's even been described by one historian as the greatest moral crusade of 19th century england after the whole debate about the abolition of slavery so it's something really um at the heart of so many english people and here we have a group of men who are kind of doing something completely opposite joining the pope's army and fighting against the the resurgimento so it's a really interesting juxtaposition. I mean, Britain had this fascination for Italy that goes back um, many, many centuries. Most Englishmen would have learnt the classics at school. Um, If they were wealthy enough, they went on the grand tour. Um, They they toured around the sites of Rome and Florence uh, and Venice. Um, They would have read Dante. They were familiar with Italian art and architecture. They were lovers of opera, which was often in the Italian language. So there's this great love for Italy. And alongside that, there was also a criticism of what was seen as the dark side of Italy. Italy as the centre of um, popery, as they called it, the centre of Catholicism. Uh, The papal states were dismissed by many Englishmen as this reactionary, corrupt regime and Full of superstition, and there was a da- desire to liberate uh, the Italians from from this state. They wanted to bring the light of the Church of England, of of Protestantism, um, to Italy, and they wanted Italy to be remade in a sort of English democratic model. So that was why they were so fasc- fascinated by the Risorgimento, um, and why there was such a a close link. You know, we forget, don't we, that anti-Catholicism was a real I identifying characteristic of being English up until certainly the 19th century. And even John Henry Newman, when he went to Rome as an, as an Anglican before his conversion, he said, you know, I still believe that the Pope was the Antichrist. It took a long time for that um, that that prejudice, that, that belief to, to disappear. Uh, and that was especially so after 1850, when the system of dioceses uh, and bishops were restored to England and Wales. And that was seen as a, a papal aggression, as an aggressive act of, of the Pope, of the Holy See. Um, and it led to a lot of um, anti-Catholic rioting and, and criticism. So there was a love for Italy, for, for many British people, but also a desire to reform Italy in an English model, Protestant and democratic. Um, and of course, you know, Britain wanted control of the Mediterranean. 
Um, it already had outposts in in Gibraltar and, and Malta and elsewhere. They wanted to control the passage to the east and to India. So if you had this new Italy on side, this new nation on side, um, it would be very important from a strategic uh, point of view. Something so, I think is important to, to mention definitely, and you that, that goes into it, is just how uh, impactful England was during that whole uh, war um, to take over the Italian peninsula by Sardinia Piedmont, um, especially when it came to um, invading the kingdom of the two Sicilies and then um, the battle and the siege of Ancona. The, the English were highly involved in all of that. Yeah, it's interesting because, you know, only a few decades previously when um, Britain was busy fighting Napoleon, um, they actually supported the return of the papacy to Rome. Um, and if you go to Windsor Castle, which is just down the road from me, uh, and you go into the beautiful Waterloo chamber with all the portraits of the allies who had defeated Napoleon, there's actually a, a portrait of Pius VII and a portrait oh. of Cardinal Consalvi there in the heart of this Protestant castle, palace. Um, but then there's a shift over the course of the 19th century. And by the time of the 1860s, um, the British government is supporting unification and questioning the right of the Pope to be to be a sovereign, to, to have his temporal power, uh, which is interesting. And um, the, the the kind of involvement of the British government in Italian unification is quite indirect in many ways. It's kind of discreet. It, it's behind the scenes. I mean, certainly when Garibaldi invaded uh, Sicily with his 1,000 volunteers, um, there were British ships around that kind of made sure that they, they got to Sicily safe and sound and that any attempts from the Neapolitans to, to intervene were kind of were, were slightly crushed. Um, it was all very um, kind of discreet in a, in a very English way, but there were certainly you know, great supporters of the movement. And, you know, Mazzini, figures like Mazzini, um, spent a lot of time in London um, in exile. England is is a haven for political exiles. I mean, Karl Marx and, and Lenin at different other different periods also spend time in London. So it, it is a kind of centre of of revolutionary thought. Now, how about uh, Ireland? Well, what is what was the feeling over there in terms of the Risorgimento? Well, I mean, Ireland is is kind of different because there's a majority. Um, Catholic population. I mean, obviously the uh, the English over there uh, would have had many of the same opinions as the 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 English in England. Um, they would have wanted a reform of Italy according to a, a Protestant democratic model. But amongst Catholics, both in Ireland and in England, there was of course um, great concern about the Risorgimento, um, and in particular any attack on the Pope's temporal power. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of um, support for the Pope. Nicholas Wiseman, one of the, the first Archbishop of Westminster, he writes a beautiful book, um, which was republished about 20 years ago. It's called Recollections of the Last Four Popes. Um, he had spent his kind of early adulthood in Rome. And it's just his his recollections of Leo XII and Gregory XVI and and. and Pius the, the eighth uh, and all the popes of the early 19th century and saying look the papacy is not corrupt um it is not reactionary there's there's it's actually a very um benevolent uh regime and there's a lot of good things going on and you know you need to kind of support this 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 ruler this legitimate ruler um there are also occasional riots clashes between supporters of garibaldi and those who didn't like him. In fact, there's a big riot in Hyde Park in London in 1862, um, where supporters of Garibaldi uh, clashed with Irish Catholics. And um, some people even refer to it as a kind of refight of Castle Pedardo uh, in London's Hyde Park. It's worth mentioning, by the way, that Garibaldi is the, in many ways one of the first modern celebrities. Uh, you know, he came to London in 1864 and I think half a million people crowded the streets of London just to see him. Um, there's a, a biscuit that you can still buy in the supermarkets over here called the Garibaldi um, biscuit, uh, which was based on the uh, the food that he apparently gave his his soldiers, a kind of a raisin, a flat, very flat raisin biscuit. But that became really popular um, in the 1860s. And that's why we can still buy it in the supermarkets here. Pubs were named after him. Um, ladies wore the Garibaldi blouse 
you know, they had their, his figure on, on and bust on, on mantelpieces. So he's a real um, celebrity. Um, he's seen as a hero of, of liberty and freedom. But many Catholics, and it's worth saying that, you know, the Catholic community was not monolithic. There were those who questioned the temporal power, the, those who thought perhaps, you know, the, the Pope, needed to be free of it to be more effective as a spiritual um leader but there are many catholics who who supported the temporal power and were happy to raise their voices against um all those who supported the resurgimento so there's a bit of a dichotomy between uh britain and uh ireland um mm -hmm. one more thing i would like to mention before we move on um is the maybe inner tor turmoil for some of the Irish in regards to the Risorgimento and their own kind of uh, freeing themselves from England. Um, the, that kind of, because at the same time they wanted, you know, they wanted a free and united Ireland, but when it came to Italy, you know, they, they didn't want that. They wanted not to say that yeah, United Italy is, is free and, and good because, you know, obviously the, uh, the, the way that it happened was was so terrible and like literally the papal soldiers died and were martyred for it um but this kind of nationalist sentiment that a lot of irish have and like you know through the ira and things like that for some of them definitely posed a inner turmoil do you have a any, yeah, yeah, absolutely about right. that? even at the time it was commented you know if you're irish surely you should have sympathy with all nationalist movements if you're fighting for your own nation, your own independent nation, then you should um, be very supportive of those in Italy trying to do the same thing. Um, but one of the points I make in my book, um, which is, I think is quite an important point, is that in a way, the fight for the temporal power was a, a sort of spiritual nationalism because Catholics felt they belonged to the, the nation of Christendom. And so just as Italians were fighting for their nation, Catholics all around the world were fighting for their supra nation you know christendom um yeah and definitely not just the states but the, the kind of wider concept um so perhaps that is a, is a form of nationalism yeah well a lot of people don't understand today and this would probably rub some of my audience the wrong way but it just is what it is um because nationalism is a is a enlightenment kind of ideology not to say you shouldn't be patriotic and proud of your country but um the ideology behind nationalism literally that's that's what got the papal states um this revolutionary thought that you know uh just because the italian peninsula share some common uh cultural identities that they should be united as one that's just so incorrect and again we the proof of that the proof in the pudding is the war that happened between sardina piedmont and the papal states and the kingdom of two sicilies i like to call and a lot of other people like to call the whole unification movement the piedmontization of mm -hmm. the italian peninsula because piedmont literally swallowed up the whole mm -hmm. peninsula and kind yeah. of forced their culture onto them and in the process um passed a lot of anti-clerical laws and really stamped out the faith and that's how we have to deal with what we um, have today in Italy it definitely led to a rise in secularism, which is very unfortunate. But um, and, and when anyway, you, when, you to, when you go to Italy, um, I mean, I think most Italians would agree that you know that Italy exists only at, at a certain level, and most people have their first loyalty to, to either their town or their region or their their, their particular um, area. Um, yeah. So you know, it hasn't worked, you know, uh, convincingly. Nationalism, though, yes, it, it comes from the French Revolution in many ways, and it, it was encouraged by Napoleon and the way he kind of interfered with all the uh, units in Italy and, and the different redrew the boundaries and introduced this concept of of a united Italy. Yeah, I, I would say it's completely different than what, what's happening, like uh, in Ireland or the desire to have united Ireland. I. United Ireland and United Italy are two very separate things. But anyway, to prevent ourselves from going down that rabbit hole anymore, let's move on to the Irish Battalion. Mm -hmm. um, so before um, there was the Papal's Wars, which were officially formed on January 1st, 1861, their unit that they derived from was the Franco-Belgians. Mm -hmm. But when the conflict first started in, the 18, in 1860, most of the Irish joined their own battalion called the Battalion of St. Patrick or the Irish Battalion. Um, so why don't you give us a history on that, Father? 
Yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating subject and one that has been written about a little bit um, compared to the English and Welsh Zouaves, which I think my book was probably the first modern study of that particular group. But there have been some studies of the Irish battalion. It's part of this big uh, recruitment moment in 1860 um, where people flood to Rome to defend the Pope. And as we all know, there were Franco-Belgian units, Austrian units, um, and, and there was a, an Irish unit. Uh, and it came from below. Uh, it wasn't something that the, the bishops particularly pushed or encouraged. Um, it, it was partly the result of uh, a count called Charles MacDonald, who was an Irish papal chamberlain, um, and, a, and a, a journalist called Alexander Sullivan, um, who was very much concerned about the Pope's temporal power and against the Resurgimento, and they formed a, a committee um, that began to bring these uh, men together. And the bishops kind of, some of the bishops were very uh, supportive and enthusiastic. Others were, were much more um, cautious. And that's a, a kind of common theme, really, in, in the story of the 1860s. The bishops uh, being a little bit cautious, not wanting to upset the authorities too much, um, trying to kind of keep a low profile. After all, Irish and English Catholics had experienced many many years of persecution um, and it was only in the 19th century really that things were beginning to become much easier and um, they were more accepted as part of the, the nation and, and the society um, and something like this could very easily um, upset everything so they, they were very uh, kind of cautious in their encouragement but the recruits some um, flew in in fact um, you know the English Zouaves were quite a small group I think there's a about 124, 125 of them. But the Irish battalion numbered about 1,300, 1,300. So that's a pretty substantial um, body. And they came from all classes, um, a lot from the kind of lower classes. Um, there were shopkeepers and policemen and a few old soldiers who had um, served with the British Army and the Crimea um, and elsewhere. Um, there were 50 rather... Uh, loud, rowdy lads from the uh, county of Kerry. And it seems that their parish priest was quite keen that they kind of join this battalion, perhaps to get them out of the way, so to stop causing trouble in, in Kerry, um, but perhaps also so that they could be formed in a bit of discipline and, and channel their energies in, in a constructive uh, way. Um, there were people who were more highly born with, with an aristocratic background. Uh, we think particularly of Frank Russell Kilau who was from a, an aristocratic family, and he was already serving with the, the papal army. Um, and he went on to join the uh, Company of St. Patrick, which we'll mention later, and also the Foreign Carabineers. Um, and he wrote a, a book in French about his, his experiences. Um, they were supposed to wear a very colourful green and yellow uniform, which I'm sure some of our listeners have seen pictures of. Um, many yeah, that's of them, the one that's on the thumbnail of this video, right. the green one. Yes, indeed. It's a, it's a really great graphics, by the way, Brendan. It's fantastic. Thank you. Um, but not not many of those uniforms were, were ready for them to wear because I mean, the time frame was pretty tight. They only had a few months really to assemble and get together and fight. Uh, but it was referred to as eggs and spinach because it was green and yellow. Um, I think some tailors made them privately for those who were a bit more wealthy, um, but many of them uh, many of the Irish soldiers had to make do with kind of secondhand uniforms, you know, whatever was available. Um, and often, because the Irish are often quite big, um, and some of the continental soldiers are, are not a are different frame, shall we say, body frame, um, the, the, the uniforms fitted really badly, uh, and that caused a lot of um, uh, discomfort and, and frustration. Um, we've we've talked a bit about motivation. Um, why did these Irish people join uh, the papal army? And we've mentioned that Ireland is is obviously heavily Catholic. Um, in a way, joining the papal army did two things. Firstly, it expressed one's love for the faith um, and love for the Holy Father, who was seen in danger. So it was a, a very wonderful way of showing that 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 piety, that love for the church. But also, it was an indirect way of getting at the English, because if the English were so supportive of the Resurgimento, um, if they hero worshipped Garibaldi um, and supported the actions of Piedmont, um, then joining the papal army was an indirect way of kind of fighting English causes. And that was certainly very much uh, in the minds of the Irish when, when they joined up. And they also saw it as, as useful military training. I mean, the Irish have a, a very distinguished 
uh, history of fighting. Um, many of them joined continental Catholic armies in the late 17th and 18th centuries. You know, the French had the famous uh, wild geese regiments um, of, of, of Irish uh, exiles. Um, and they always kind of wanted, it seemed, to, to have some military experience because that could be used um, for their own fight for independence um, when, when, that, when that was appropriate. Um, so, so some people said, yeah, join the papal army because your training is not going to be wasted. We might need you for a future struggle um, in Ireland. And of course, there's always that desire for adventure um, and to kind of have a new experience. And you know, most of these Irish guys just wouldn't have had the opportunity to travel to Italy. Um, and there's even a sense of pilgrimage. You know, that we're going to go to Rome. Let we we can visit the, the shrines and the basilicas and and see the Pope. Um, so that was also part of the um, the motivation. What always stands out to me um, is the lengths that some of them went or the sacrifices that they made uh, to do this, especially with the policemen who had a, uh, the opportunity to have like a really nice pension. And mm -hmm. at the time, Ireland was not a, was not, you know, very financially or economically stable. You know, the potato hap famine would happen decades later and a lot of them would come to America. But these, you know, motivated by piety, the sacrifice mm -hmm. in faith, a lot of them, they gave up a lot to, yeah. to go and, and, fight for the pope and not only did they potentially lose their pension and their salary and their security uh but it was illegal uh, and this is the same in so many other countries i mean i think in, in the netherlands technically the zouaves kind of lose their citizen status don't yes. they by, by joining yeah. the papal army um a lot of them didn't get it back some of them got it back at the mm -hmm. um in the decades after but a lot of them didn't and America, too, in the United States, that's actually part of the reason that the United States contingent really never uh, came to fruition or the fact that so many or there were so few from the United States was it was also uh, illegal. And in Britain, there is the Foreign Enlistment Act of 1819, um, which also affects the, the Canadians, by the way, and, and some of our other um, kind of domains. Uh, but that meant that you couldn't join a foreign army. Uh, of course, it didn't stop the English. You know, a lot of uh, throughout the 19th century, there were lots of examples of Britons joining various causes. I mean, in my book, I mentioned the concept of ideological volunteering, um, which is something quite new to the period after the French Revolution. You know, actually joining to fight for a cause, whether it's a national cause or, or, or whatever. And, and uh, you know, Britons joined the uh, the first Carlist War, although um, on a more liberal side. Um, they, they go to South America to fight for the various independent struggles over there. Um, so it's something that, that, that happens a lot. And the government normally uh, kind of ignored these things. They didn't kind of uh, apply the Foreign Enlistment Act. There were attempts to prevent these Irishmen from joining the papal army. Um, I mean, there's one example in June 1860 when the local landowner, Sir Thomas Ross of Drogheda, um, arrives uh, by the dock and enters the ship in search of one of his men, one of his laborers who has uh, joined up and they, they couldn't find him. And, and, and as the ship went, went off, the whole crowd kind of cheered and, and, and applauded. Um, but the problem was that at the same time as the Irish joined in the papal army, a lot of Englishmen were joining Garibaldi's uh, army. Um, they, they went to, especially after the invasion of Sicily, um, there was actually a, several English units um, and the English went over to fight for the Resurgimento rather than against the Resurgimento. So that kind of struggle of England versus Ireland is, is being fought out in, in the Italian peninsula. With, um, Irish joining the Papal Army and some English joining Garibaldi's army, even though they don't directly fight each other in, in, in battle, uh, which is interesting. But these um, supporters of Garibaldi, they uh, refer to themselves as excursionists. You know, we're not actually soldiers. Um, don't arrest us. Don't uh, get us into trouble because we're just making an excursion to to Italy and we're studying the volcanic phenomena of Mount Etna. <laughs> so leave us alone. Likewise, the Irish join in the papal army. Um, they only technically enlist when they reach Italy. Um, and so that if they're questioned at the at the dock, they they'll say, "Well, I'm just a pilgrim to Rome, or I'm I'm a labourer going off in search of work, or I'm I'm making a, a tour of of Italy." So there were kind of ways around it. Yeah, they um but it's it's very funny how it's applied though, because with the Irish they're going to do what they can to try to stop them, but with the English mm -hmm. they'll look the other way. So yeah. 
um cool. you know it's you know very similar to that to today the uh you know the powers that be if they want something they'll you know ignore the law to their benefit mm-hmm. but if they uh want to apply it to the fullest to um get at the opposite side they definitely mm-hmm. will okay so they so the irish battalion it forms uh or it it starts to organize and form in ireland and mm-hmm. what happens once they reach reach italy complete confusion and chaos basically um oh it, unfortunately it, it, sadly it all happens very quickly I don't think they really expected Piedmont to invade the Papal States so quickly. Um, and they, they did hope for, for more time. And one of the, the great historians um, who wrote that wonderful book on the Pope's army, Al- Alvarez, he kind of said, yes. really, this, which is a fantastic book and it's very detailed and, and probably the, the most important work in English, I'd say, from a military point of view on, on this period. Um, yeah, it's very detailed in the military specifics. Yeah, it's really good. Um, but he says that, you know, really this campaign happened two years too soon. You know, um, if the papal army had uh, had the time just to kind of train and form itself and plan, um, there could have been a, quite a different outcome. But the Irish uh, volunteers, they arrive in different parts of Italy at different stages. Um, even the guy who is given command, Miles O'Reilly, Um, He kind of arrives quite late. There's a confusion about exactly who's in charge and who the commanding officer is. Um, And much to their disgust, the Irish troops are scattered. They really hope that they would stay together and fight together. But they are scattered across Italy in in different uh, garrisons and and, and centres. And there's a bit of a nervousness, actually, from the Holy See about keeping national groups together. You know, I mean, there are lots of attempts at a later stage for you know, uh, Zouave battalions that would just be defined by a particular nation, you know, perhaps have an English battalion and a Dutch battalion, but they, they like to kind of spread them around and, and, and scatter them. And that caused a lot of um, uh, frustration. There wasn't a huge amount of time to train them either. You know, um, it, you can't become a soldier overnight. And some of these weapons they were using, they were, they were quite inaccurate, you know, old rifles that took a lot of time to <laughs> to fire with any skill. Um, they only often had just a few weeks um, to, to, to learn the basics. But as I said, the um, action happens very quickly. Um, the Piedmontese invade the Papal States. Um, officially, they're protecting the Pope uh, against what's happening in, in, in Sicily, uh, protecting him against revolution. Of course, they have ulterior motives. Um, and they invade in, in two main columns with, a, with a, another column, a reserve column also going down the centre. Um, the Irish first uh, find action in Perugia, um, which are attacked by the 5th Piedmontese Corps. Um, and there's a lot of fierce fighting in the streets, you know, house to house fighting. And, and many of the Irish um, show a great deal of courage uh, in that particular action, which only lasts really a, a few hours before Perugia is uh, surrenders and, and is handed over. Um, Spoleto has a much larger Irish garrison. In fact, it, it, it's under Miles O'Reilly, the, the commander of the, the St. Patrick's Battalion. He's actually based in, in Spoleto. They only have two working cannon, um, but they still try their best to defend the city from uh, the Piedmontese. Uh, and they they know that they're outnumbered. You know, they, they know that there's a good chance they're going to die. Um, in fact, one Dubliner, one of the volunteers from Dublin, uh, spends the night before the attack reading spiritual books, preparing for, for death, if that's what happens, um, going to confession. And he wrote, we were all expecting to be slaughtered. Um, and that's something that comes across a lot in our subjects over the 1860s. You know, the, the, the Zouaves and the Irish Battalion and, and the other units, they kind of knew that the odds were against them, um, that there was a good chance that um, they wouldn't win. Um, every battle but nevertheless they they persevered and they tried their best and they knew that this was a cause worth fighting for and it was their duty um to to do so they didn't just sort of and, give up and, and surrender and it was typically the the zouaves uh, and the irish who were the most motivated to keep fighting often you would see that the um that the local units so the ones comprised of Romans and uh, other people across the papal states, they, not to say that they weren't motivated and they wanted to, you know, fight for the cause, but the indigenous units did not have the same zeal 
um, that the Zwaves and the Irish displayed. Uh, for example, in the Battle of Castel Fidardo, um, after the army was just completely uh, was routed and was basically destroyed and only uh, about half of them returned back to Loreto um, to figure out what to do next because the, the Peabonese army was going to come and attack Loreto now. Uh, there was a council of war that was held and the, the ones that wanted to keep fighting were the Swiss, Irish, and then the Franco-Belgians. The the others, um, no, they were like, we're, we're done. This, is, we're, this isn't going to look good um, because the others had the majority of the forces they they surrendered exactly i mean if, if you're um enthusiastic enough to leave your job and your family and possibly lose your pension and join an army not for money i mean people did call them mercenaries but they weren't mercenaries they didn't do it for the money they did it um to do their duty and to, and to express their faith and, and to um you know to get a different sort of glory um and so they were highly motivated and that's why the pope um in many ways preferred being protected by foreign bayonets you know because I'm, I'm not criticizing the italians here but you know the the italians were more, more likely to to be uncomfortable about fighting their fellow countrymen you know uh, um and there were all sorts of complex emotions that must have come into their hearts uh, it was really almost sort of civil war for them wasn't it um but for um somebody from another country with a very clear idea of of the um the cause and the ideology uh, it, it was different. Now, could you say a few words about uh, Lieutenant Darcy and uh, the Irish who defended the artillerymen at Castel Fidardo? Yeah, we don't know a huge amount actually about the Irish um, at Castel Fidardo. A, a lot of them haven't uh, left detailed uh, descriptions um, about it, uh, but Lieutenant Darcy was one of them and he becomes a long serving um, Zouave, but they. Uh, uh, certainly um, very courageous in escorting the artillery over the river um, under heavy fire. Um, and they are present at every stage of the battle, going up the up the hill um, and engaging. He was like them. 16 or 16 too or yeah. something like that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, amazing, amazing uh, courage. Uh, and it was said, I mean, the, later the authorities say how well the Irish fought, that they... they um, did not retreat but they only kind of when it was no longer possible to advance that's when they had to kind of were forced to to, to fall back and then of course there was um nicholas furry if i don't mm -hmm. know if it's fury or furry uh he lost his leg he lost um, his leg and he became yeah. a sort of minor celebrity in rome after that and, and there's a picture of him dressed as a zouave um yeah. with, with, with a crutch and, and and his leg missing and i mean i found a reference to a a, a dinner hosted by various cardinals to which people like nicholas Fury um were invited of course that's a confusing thing isn't it with the, the zouaves that there were some uh kind of zouave uniforms around in 1860 before the regiment was actually founded officially in january 1861 but it's kind of that you know when when exactly did that zouave uniform uh, begin to be worn? There were, there were some cases, um, even yeah. That that, that's doing. that's a big reason why like the Franco Belgians are essentially just considered the zouaves yeah. because that it was it was before like they had that official name the papal zouaves, but they, that's basically what they were. So that's mm -hmm. why I would consider and I would say I would agree with most other people would consider the Franco Belgians are just the uh, the very first stage of that, yeah. but yeah. they share the same history. Um, uh, motivations and everything like mm -hmm. that um okay so we talked about castel fodardo there's one last big fight unless um i'm forgetting there's yeah. some ancona so what was the <laughs> irish presence like at ancona there were quite a few uh irish there uh, in the garrison i mean it's, it's a big it's probably the biggest battle ready or siege of, of the 1860 campaign i mean ancona is a big uh a big port one of the main ports of the papal states um and the irish are very much in, in involved there i think it was just under 6,000 defenders against forces of 34,000. Uh, and it wasn't just the army, it was also the Italian Navy um, or the Piedmontese Navy uh, that, that were involved in bombarding the city. Um, but there are descriptions of the Irish uh, cheering uh, for Pius IX every time there was a, a, a volley um, sent towards the ships. Uh, and, and again, they, they fought uh, very bravely. Okay, so unfortunately, we know what happens. Um, 
There is no Catholic help that arrives in terms of a foreign power. That's really what they were holding out for in the 1860 campaign. They were really hoping that through Ancona, Austria or Spain uh, would assist them, but that didn't happen. So unfortunately, the siege from the Piedmont East side was successful. Um, and we, we were left with, uh, or what the papal states were left with was just Lats- the Lazio region, was just Rome and its surrounding territories. The whole rest of the papal states was taken over by the Piedmontese. Mm-hmm. So in this aftermath, what became of the Irish battalion? Well, many of them uh, go home. And in fact, they're given a hero's welcome, which is quite a contrast to what happened to the English Zouaves in 1870. I mean, there's a muted welcome, as we'll talk perhaps later in Liverpool, but um, you know, not much goes on. But in Ireland, there are descriptions of of local kind of perceptions of, of the of the returning uh, Zou, um, Irish battalion. Uh, certainly, for Miles O'Reilly, um, he is kind of dragged through the streets in a carriage uh, with illuminations everywhere. There, there, there are celebrations. There, there's a recognition that they've 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 done their duty, that they they fought well, even though they've um, you know, didn't succeed militarily, uh, and in sermons around the place that the, the dead are seen as martyrs um, and they're eulogized in in sermons. I mean, even in London, um, the future Cardinal Manning, who isn't a bishop at that time, he compares the fallen of Castle Fidardo to earlier martyrs like St. Thomas Beckett, St. Thomas of, of Canterbury, you know, both fighting for the independence and liberty of the church. So, so kind of um, comparisons like that are made. But in terms of the Irish battalion, there's a very small remnant that stays on in Italy and they become the company of St. Patrick. And it's quite hard tracing exactly uuh, their history. I mean, they continue until about 1862. Um, and then when, when they finally uh, fade away, many of them join the Zouaves or other units uh, in the papal armies. But of course, one big thing that happens is uh, a certain civil war in america uh, which breaks out which you'll know far more um, about. some might call it a, a war of northern aggression <laughs> whatever you call it um and there is an attempt to recruit experienced army officers from the various european armies uh and uh the union certainly recruit um some of the members of the company of saint patrick in fact the archbishop of new york goes to rome with that with that purpose in mind um and Probably the most famous former member of the Battalion of St. Patrick is Miles Keogh, uh, who I'm sure many of you uh, have heard of. He fought at Gettysburg and some of the other key battles of the uh, Civil War in America. Um, then he joined the 7th Cavalry. And of course, he lost his life eventually at Little Bighorn, that most kind of iconic of, of battles. Um, and apparently his body was the only one on the battlefield that was not mutilated. Uh, because he was wearing a Castle Fidardo medal and an Agnus Dei, which was seen as a, a, a relic, a holy, a holy thing, and that was respected by um, by the well, what do we call them? Indigenous indigenous peoples, or whatever is yes. the right way of calling them. Um, and First Nation, I, I, don't, I don't know what you're supposed to call them, um, but in fact, they took the Castle Fidardo medal, and I think Sitting Bull, the uh, the chief. Um, he's pictured in some uh, photos wearing the Castle Fidardo medal. He just saw it as a holy talisman. But even there, there's a recognition that Miles Keogh was a, a great hero, a brave soldier, a warrior. Um, and what he had done in Italy, um, as well as elsewhere, was seen as as worthy of, uh, of, of, of tribute. Yeah. From my understanding is that they, um, the, the Native Americans there were, were catechized maybe not the best right but from my understanding is that they they were catholic um and sitting bull was also catholic which is why they didn't mutilate him because they recognized the importance of the medal um unless that is that uh not correct father have you heard something different i don't know i, I think um anything american i i kind of bow to your okay. superior knowledge yeah. that's, that they, <laughs> that, that's that's my understanding of it yeah. i would love to i have to reconfirm um and but i've seen the pictures that, of- that, that, that shows that the Casa Fidardo medal was kind of yeah. recognized, um, you know, even because by- in that picture, Sitting Bull is yeah. wearing a crucifix. So it's they were yeah. catechized. They knew like, yeah. OK, well, like probably shouldn't, you know, mutilate the guy who has a medal from the Pope. Probably not the best idea. But uh, anyway, uh, moving on. So 
or I, I guess one last thing. So would you say from this point forward, most of the Irish who uh, join the papal army uh, go into the papal zouaves? Um, you mean the company of St. Patrick or the... No, no, so, so the company of St. Patrick, they, they yeah. um, and after 1862, they dissipated. Um, I'm saying from that point after the Irish uh, company is no longer, uh, would you say that most of the Irish who join the papal army end up joining the papal zouaves? I think they they do join other regiments as well, um, but I think many of them certainly join the Zouaves. I mean, I think the, the company of St. Patrick had become quite small by 1862. You know, we're talking um, under 100, certainly. Uh, and I'm sure many probably went home as well. They thought they'd done their service. And, you know, in the early 1860s, there, there was that kind of slight frustration that there was no immediate follow up to uh, Casa Fadado and and Kona. Many of the people joined in the papal army after 1860 thought, right, okay, there must be a, something, another war, another campaign, um, whether it, it was aggressive or, or defensive. Um, and there was a you know quite a lot of disappointment up until 1867 that nothing much seemed to be happening. Um, people in the papal army were basically doing garrison duty and fighting brigands, um, but not fi not fighting for the, the, the papal states as such. Yeah, we enter a period of of inaction, and not complete because we, you know, the, like you mentioned, the brigands, and there's an occasional border dispute, like with uh, in Soprano in southern Italy in uh, 1862, where a lot of Piedmontese try to cross the border and kind of uh, harass a town where there are a lot of Neapolitan refugees, and the Zouaves drove them off. Um, but anyway, yeah, you're right. N nothing too crazy up until you know 1866 in terms of history, where things pick up. And it's uh, we have the September convention where the French were going to pull back the garrison they had in Rome. So the Piedmontese increased their aggression. So what this leaves us with then is uh, um, is a conflict that will inevitably happen. So the Garibaldians, they are supported and encouraged to invade the Papal States. And that's now in 1867. So mm -hmm. there were two prominent English Papal Zouaves at this time. Uh, there was Alfred Coolidge and then there mm -hmm. was... Um, Julian Watts Russell. So, if you could say uh, something about them. So, as you say, there are there are not many English Zouaves in the first well six years, really, of the five six years of the unit's existence. Uh, the Irish had done their bit. Um, many of them had returned home. There were a few Irish around, but it took the English a bit of time to to join the calls in any meaningful way. There were one or two, um, and in fact. Two of the earliest English Zouaves actually are the two that lost their lives in the 1867 campaign. And that's what's unique about the English Zouaves is that their number was tiny, really, compared to the Dutch and the French and the Belgians, you know, 124 English Zouaves. Um, and I think in total, let me just look at my notes. In total, there were 328 Zouaves, 328 from Britain and Ireland, so including the Irish. So that's about 3% of the unit's total composition. So it's a really tiny group. And yet two English Zouaves lost their lives in action. And, you know, the the, the list of those who were killed in action is, is relatively um, short compared to the wars that we've, you know, seen in more recent times. Um, I, I don't know exactly, Brendan, how many were, killed, were actually killed in action, but I think we're talking... 100 200s i don't know it's, it's uh, yeah i'm not um I, I think it might be a little more than that um yeah. but definitely uh comparatively like yeah. uh another war is like no um but <laughs> there was an interesting study um i don't have it pulled up in front of me so i'm not entirely sure um the majority of the swabs who did die actually did not die in combat they died from uh, disease yeah. um there was a big uh, col col cholera outbreak in 1866 yeah. They didn't claim too many Zouaves, but the point is that, yes, throughout the 10 year history, most of the Zouaves who did die died not from combat, mm -hmm. but actually from yeah. disease. So the fact that, that two Englishmen died in combat and not from disease or anything else uh, is something that we're certainly very, very kind of conscious of and proud of. Um, so the first of them is Alfred Collingridge, who came from a family in Oxfordshire. And what's interesting is that both Collingridge and Watts Russell. Um, they both had brothers who were also in the Zouaves, you know, again, which is something we see quite a bit, you know, brothers, siblings or cousins um, joining the Zouaves together. Um, but Alfred hoped to become a, a Jesuit. He was a very uh, pious young man and he was uh, 
uh, in France uh, in a college at the time he he joined the Zouaves, and I'm sure that helped him. Uh, you know, the, the Zouave cause was so popular in France, and and so, and every, everyone knew about it. That probably a allowed him to kind of access the Zouaves in a way that many English people um, couldn't have done. Um, and he was wounded fatally at Monte Libretti, one of the smaller actions of 1867. Um, and he was taken to a makeshift hospital at Narola. Um, and he said, the Lord has given me a favour that I have asked to die for the Holy Father. And he spoke about shedding his blood uh, for the church and specifically for the conversion of England, for, for the, the Catholic uh, community in England. So he was the first one to die um, in that campaign. And then a few days, weeks later, uh, Julian Watts Russell um, was killed towards the end of the Battle of Mentana. And he belonged to a, a convert family. His, his father had become a, a Catholic and his whole family kind of came along with him. His father actually had been a friend of St. John Henry Newman. Um, and in fact, when Newman became a Catholic, in 1845, uh, one of the first people he wrote to was Michael Watts Russell. So he was moved in that in that circle. And interestingly, his dad, uh, Michael Watts Russell, he eventually became a priest. Uh, when, when he was widowed, when Julian's mother died, he became a priest and he ended his days in Lourdes as one of the first English speaking uh, chaplains. And also Julian's brother um, became a, a priest as well. He joined the Passionist Order. So it's obviously a very um, pious religious family. Uh, Julian Watts Russell trained at a big school, Catholic school in Ushaw, which is also a seminary, um, and he was known for his uh, piety. And it said, um, viewers might not particularly like this image, but whenever he fired his gun, he always said uh, Ave Maria for the soul that he might be dispatching into eternity. Uh, I, I think my viewers would probably like that <laughs> message. Um, but what's uh, interesting about... That julian and it didn't happen so much with alfred i guess because he he died in a makeshift hospital and was kind of buried locally but julian's body was brought back to rome in triumph um and he was laid in state uh almost like a christian martyr he was surrounded with evergreens he had a part a martyr's palm in his hand and um, people came and kind of venerated his body they, they would take the leaves of the evergreens home with them they, they kissed his body. Um, and then there was a solemn requiem mass at the English College in Rome. Uh, and in fact, his his brother who was there, he said it's almost it's more like a festa. It's almost, it was more like a celebration than a, than a sad funeral, almost like a, a kind of canonization. Um, and then he was buried at the Campo Verano uh, Cemetery uh, in Rome, where there's a, a, a monument to the to the Zouaves. Uh, yes. So speaking about... Um... Julian during the battle, from my understanding, um, and this ties into why they viewed him so heroically, uh, he was the closest to the walls of the castle at Mentana. So the Mentana was a town, but it, it had these these castle walls that surrounded a, a part of key buildings and infrastructure. And so mm -hmm. that's where the Garibaldians were, were massed. So mm -hmm. the goal was to get through to that. And when Julian fell, correct me if I'm wrong, he was the, the closest one to that at that point. Yeah, that was the, the tradition. Um, it was that to combine with his youth. He, he was 17. He was one of the, I think, the youngest Suave actually to, to die in action. So there's that sense of, you know, this kind of pure young man dying for the faith, um, just like some of the kind of Roman, early Roman martyrs. He also left some writings behind, prayers, um, which were included, some of the sentiments were included in some of the songs of, of the Zouaves uh, that were written. And um, if you could um, maybe talk about the comparison that was made between uh, Julian and um, Joseph Louise Gern. Yeah, I mean, certainly, I mean, there is a, an English uh, life of Julian Watts Russell. I, I, have you found that? It's, I think it's, oh, of course. it is available, yes. yeah, by, it's translated from the Italian. And in fact, Cardinal Manning wrote the, wrote the preface. Um, but he is compared to Guaran, uh, and he's very much the kind of English version uh, and there were, you know, attempts later on to to kind of uh, exhume Julian's body and perhaps even think about a cause for canonization, just as there were for Guirin. Uh, you know, there were obviously miracles attributed to him uh, and, and, a, and a monument 
around his grave and sort of pilgrimages were made to it. Um, but of course, it never actually, he was never raised to the altars of the church. But, you know, there are a number of, of Zouaves who are treated as martyrs and saints. And although they're forgotten today, uh, at the time, they were kind of household names. And in, in Julian's old school, in his college, I mean, he was a, a celebrity. You know, they, um, they had lots of pictures of him that they gave out to the to the boys. Um, and his name was 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 long celebrated and remembered. Yes, of course, that's something that this organization, we would really, you know, one of our main goals is to preserve those names and bring them back um, into the into the light so that we can maybe explore the possibility of moving forward on that. And that's a big, big ask. And that's a big mission. But this is we got to start somewhere um, now. And the sad thing, the sad thing is just how little archival material there is about these, yes. these guys. you know, I mean. I've seen one or two letters of Julian Watts Russell, which are preserved in the archive at Ushaw, but you know, there's not much. Um, now, in regards to um, the, his, his original monument, because you mentioned it's the English, mm -hmm. it's, it's in the English College in Rome. Um, mm -hmm. I know there's a little bit of a story behind that, and it involved um, some pro Sardinia Piedmont and Garibaldian people um, disrespecting it. Could you maybe tell us a bit about that? Yeah, it's. Um, can't quite remember the exact details, uh, but I think, that, as you say, his monument was um, disrespected and kind of defaced a little bit, and it was put into a cellar um, of a place in one of the, was it a restaurant, I think, in, in Mentana, and it kind of languished there for many years, and, and eventually there was a, a priest in Rome who wanted to uh, revive the memory of Julian Watts Russell, and actually he, he was the one who arranged the exhumation of his body uh, and, and building a new tomb for him. Um, and, and he's the one who was responsible for moving the monument to the uh, English College Chapel. Um, and although the, the English College had been there for many centuries, they built a new chapel uh, in 1888. Um, and, and it became a kind of shrine to the English saints and, and, and the English connection to the, the Holy See. And it, it, felt, it, was, it felt very appropriate to have a, a monument to uh, Julian there. Okay. Now, before we move on, just really quick. Um, so Arno uh, Hommel from the Odenbosch mm -hmm. Netherlands, who I think works at the museum there, this yes. People's Wall Museum yeah. in Odenbosch. You should definitely check it out. But anyway, he commented on the previous, um, the death question of how many Zouaves died in battle. And, and so he said about 25 Dutch died, while about 120 di uh, died in combat, while about 120 died from disease. So... Mm -hmm. That should go to show you the discrepancy and the difference in the numbers. Yeah. But anyway, uh, thank you for yeah, that comment. Arno, by the way. Arno is a good friend of mine, so um, good good to know that you're there, Arno. And the Zouave Museum in Oldenbosch, which I did visit uh, some years ago, is is definitely worth visiting. Um, if you should oh, ever be in that area, yes, hope, I hope to be there within uh, the next six months. But that's yeah. a, another story. But anyway, um, okay. So moving on, how did the martyrdom of Colin Ridge and Watts Russell, how did that impact English recruiting moving forward and even potentially Irish recruiting? Yeah, well, in fact, the Irish, um, they kind of slightly lost interest in the whole uh, movement. I think they felt they'd done their bit in 1860. And the situation had changed a bit in, in Ireland and there, many Irishmen were kind of more concerned with the Fenian uh, cause, uh, which, of course, was also felt in in north america um and, and their attention was a little less off 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 rome so this was kind of the english moment when it when it came to supporting the pope and, and fighting for him um and there was a huge interest after the death of Collingridge and watts russell um and a huge enthusiasm after a papal victory you know the, the call seemed so um desperate at times so could they really achieve anything and yet mentana was a great boost in morale um of course, we know the Pope was heavily criticised uh, by poets and, and writers you know, for, for shedding the blood of, of um, Italian nationalists and, and using um, the Chassepo rifle uh, and you know, being, being shown such aggression. Um, but for Catholics, it was a, it was a very uh, encouraging moment. And the numbers of English and Welsh and Scottishmen joining the Zouaves uh, rose incredibly, um, even though it was comparatively small compared to other other countries. Uh, there was no real uh, organized movement as such um, that the bishops didn't really directly address the issue. They didn't write pastoral letters saying, yeah, we want you to 
to join up. But we know that some bishops, at least behind the scenes, were very supportive. In fact, Cardinal Manning said to one of the Zouaves recruits, um, you know, after being a priest, this is the greatest way of, of, of showing your support for the church and, and, and serving the church. So it's kind of put up there alongside um, the priesthood in the in the eyes of, of, of Manning. Um, um, well, many of them were seminarians uh, or who would later go on to become priests. Yeah, or they or they knew seminarians. In fact, you know, the English College Rome was a, a real center for the English Zouaves. And many of them have been at school, you know, with, with the students at the English College and, and they kind of kept in touch with each other. We've said earlier that the Zouave movement in many ways was a movement movement from below rather than from above. You know, it was kind of lay um, apostles, really. It was a lay apostolate. Um, and there was a committee formed called the Papal Defence Committee, uh, which helped. It, it didn't take control of recruitment, but it kind of helped uh, support people who wanted to go to Rome, perhaps gave them grants of money, or helped them with information, told them what to do. Um, and, and in a very discreet way, that, that did a lot of um, good work in encouraging recruits. And there were some uh, individual priests who uh, encouraged it, not like the great um, priest in Oldenbosch who, who sent so many uh, Dutch Zouaves off to Rome. Um, but there was one priest in the northeast of England called Thomas Wilkinson, who later became a bishop. Um, and I think he uh, succeeded in uh, sending seven parishioners uh, to the Zouaves. And there's a lovely picture in, in, in the book, actually, of him posing with his uh, Zouave parishioners on, on a visit uh, to Rome. Um, of course, you know, one of the big questions I often ponder, and I don't have the complete answer to this, is why were there so many Dutch Zouaves and yet so few English Zouaves? Because in many ways, the situation in the Netherlands and uh, Britain is relatively similar. Um, Netherlands is, it, is a majority Protestant country, had a Protestant monarch, same with England. Um, both countries had had a, a newly restored hierarchy of bishops. Uh, England, it was 1850, and I think Holland, it was a few years later, and that caused a lot of um, debate and, and, and uh, even kind of disagreement. Um, and yet, you know, the Dutch were able to get themselves together and send so many off, but not the English. Um, I imagine part of it was perhaps because of that English caution, not wanting to upset the apple cart, uh, as we would say, we've just achieved. Um, Catholic relief and emancipation. We've got these new bishops. Um, we don't really want to upset things. And there was that big debate in British history about can you really be a loyal Englishman and a loyal Catholic at the same time? You know, we were seen as foreigners. We were seen as disloyal. Um, we were seen as fifth columnists supporting a foreign monarch. And obviously joining a, a foreign army it was a very uh, obvious way of saying, well, you know, people would think Catholics are not completely loyal to their country. Um, so that obviously that caution was there, uh, as well as the fact that it was illegal to join um, due to the Foreign Enlistment Act. And perhaps there was a bit of English superiority as well. You know, why would we want to join another person's army and another country's army? We've got the greatest army uh, in the world. You know, if you want to do military service, you join the British army. You, you don't, don't join um, a, an army in, a, in, a, in the Mediterranean. So I'm sure a bit of that was 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 going on. I think a part of that um, too might be the um, there was more of a like kind of like maybe an underground Catholicism. Maybe this is not the right time period of English history, but the where people could live live more of a Catholic, a secret Catholic life. And I know with um, <laughs> um, Saint John Henry Newman that kind of started to give more outs where you had more high profile people uh, convert. I mean, maybe that had something to do with it. You would know more than me. Well, that that tradition, yeah. I mean, by eighteen sixties, uh, Catholics are much more in in the open. You know, big churches are being built in in all the cities. Um, we've got pretty much complete freedom compared to a hundred years before. You know, as recently as 1771, we, we had an English bishop tried basically for being a priest. He was acquitted. But, you know, the, that was still happening in 1771. hundred years later, um, we were operating in, in pretty much free, complete freedom, although there was still that caution and there was a lot mm -hmm. of anti-Catholic prejudice uh, and discrimination. Um, maybe we could, uh, you could tell me a bit about the... Um... Uh, and this came from, I believe, Julian Watts Russell, the theme 
that the Canadians would adopt. The, the Anamadea, I'm, I'm not saying that correctly. The, you know what I'm saying? Father, you know, the Latin. You're saying. I'm just uh, reminding myself of what it was because I it's been a few years since I wrote this yes, book. The, so um, the English the English Papal's Wafts had a big influence on the Canadian Papal's Wafts. Mm -hmm. They certainly um, did. And especially that 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 little anima mia that that phrase from uh, julian watts russell's um prayer book which was made part of the canadian uh, hymn um and there was also a hymn written by um a nun in england for the english zouaves and i think that the, the, the same kind of phrase um was put in there i mean there was a strong uh identity for the english zouaves um and we should mention the women here um women don't get much of a mention in this story but there was an amazing English lady called Mrs. Stone, who was almost like the mother to the English Zouaves, um, a kind of Florence Nightingale figure. Don't know if you've heard of Florence Nightingale in America, but she, she kind of looked <laughs> no, after but... their, 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 she, she was a nurse who kind of helped the, the soldiers in the, in the Crimean War and you know introduced new standards of hygiene uh, to medicine. Um, but Mrs. Stone, you know, she, she uh, helped the English Zouaves. Um, she... Uh, especially helped them on the battlefield, caring for the wounded, um, giving them food. Um, she was also worked as a as a journalist. She wrote for the Tablet Journal, one of the main Catholic uh, uh, publications. Um, and she was there, ever present behind the scenes, um, helping the Zouaves and being a sort of maternal figure to them. And, and she was present at Mentana uh, on the battlefield um, with, with the first aid posts. Um, and there was another lady as well who uh, made two banners two flags for the English Zouaves, which were never carried into battle because they weren't official um, flags, but they were, you know, part of that identity um, along with the, 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 the English Zouaves hymn or, or song that we refer to with the words of, of Junior Watts Russell. And uh, the translated uh, of what we're saying of, of that verse is, means love God and, and go thy way. Um, yes, but right. in anima mia, anima mia, alma dio et tira via. My soul, my soul, be this thy song. Love, love thy God and speed along. Um, and the uh, Canadian Zouaves used it as their motto. They translated it into French and it formed the chorus of the Song of the English Zouaves, which was uh, composed by this nun, Mother Drain. Um, love God, O my soul, love him alone. And then with light heart, go thy way. So th that was part of Julian's popularity, not just his youth and his um, perceived holiness and piety, but he he'd left these writings that became part of the, the 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 identity of the Zouaves, the English Zouaves. So uh, you mentioned the flags. Um, I'm very interested in this because if you actually go to the website, our, our website, peoplezouave.com, I uh, recreated the Carlist Zouave Battalion flag. Um, I I you know I'm, as a military guy myself, I, I just I think they're really cool. Yep. Is there any surviving? photos or are they in an archive anywhere i would love to no, take it's look. Probably not. i don't know what happened to it um i guess one of the zouaves probably would have taken it home with him but um who knows what happened i guess it you know just didn't survive it would probably disintegrated um but in my book i can't quite find the page but there is a description that i got from one of the newspapers of of the uh flag i think saint george is there and our lady and the, possibly the, the british coat of arms and and, and <sighs> the papal keys well, I'm Perhaps, sure uh, someone can your, recreate it one day. Well, with it, your talent for graphics, Brendan, I'm sure you can do something or, or perhaps get uh, an artist. Maybe. To, to the, the one that did survive in terms of small amount of pictures is the Canadian one. It has a beaver mm -hmm. on it. So mm -hmm. that would probably be my next project in terms of the flags because I can literally I can I can see it. Um, so that's really cool that the Canadians have the beaver. I guess. And of course, the Canadians uh, introduced the sport to Italy, didn't they? Oh, uh, yes. Lacrosse. lacrosse. Yeah, that was their great one of their great contributions to Italian culture. Um, so we we were talking about the um, the non English soldiers' support of the English papal Zouaves. So mm -hmm. um, could you talk a little bit about the English Zouave club they had for them? So many of the nations uh, represented in the Zouaves had their own clubs. Uh, there was a, a Dutch club and, and, a, and a French club, um, and there was an English club that was founded um, just around the corner from the English College. They had a, a, a room with full of English books and journals. They had a, a billiards table, of course, which in the 1860s is pretty essential. There was a room where they could stay when they were kind of off duty, perhaps uh, on leave. Uh, you could buy a, a fairly cheap meal 
in fact one of the zouaves was uh basically employed as the the kind of housekeeper and, and, and assist administrator if you like of the club and it's also where the the chaplain um lived there, there were two uh english priests who were sent out to rome as chaplain so even though it's quite a small unit it's, it's significant that there were you know the bishop sent priests to, um to to serve the, the zouaves and one of them came from a very aristocratic family um the stoner family they have a house near oxford um which is still open it's a beautiful uh, house with hiding holes and and um you know lots of lovely uh, portraits uh monsignor stoner was the the chief chaplain to the english zouaves uh so the English club was a very important hub for the, the Zouaves. Um, there was a bit of disagreement with the Irish Zouaves. They kind of didn't really want to go to the English club and eventually a separate Irish club uh, was founded. So although the English and the, and the Irish served alongside each other in the, in the Zouaves, there was a bit of tension there. Could you um, tell us how they celebrated St. George's Day? Well, I mean, they had a whole religious life. Uh, in the Zouaves. Um, they, they'd have retreats um, together. Uh, they even had a St. Vincent de Paul society to help the poor, um, which the English were involved in. And for St. George's Day, they, they would have a dinner um, and a special mass at the Church of San Giorgio in Valabro, which is uh, the church in Rome dedicated to St. George, which has a, various relics of him. Um, and they'd have a mass and then a big dinner. And, and there were uh, the Italians present in the restaurant were very surprised that the the English could toast both the Pope and Her Majesty the Queen um, at the same <laughs> function. And I think there was a fairly uh, boisterous rendition of God Save the Queen, our national anthem um, at this dinner. I would have loved to have been there to see that. <laughs> and that was kind so, of, you know, it was fighting the idea that you couldn't be English and Catholic. You know, here we yes, have English yes. wives, loyal subjects of the Queen, but also fighting for their faith. It's that it's in... How do we move forward with being in a government or a country whose regime currently has beliefs that are antithetical to being Catholic? How do we move forward uh, with that? And uh, how do we how do we how do we try to make the faith uh, influence them? So it's that struggle. It's like mm -hmm. yes, like I'm English or I'm American, and I recognize that our uh, the government right now is doing a lot of anti-Catholic things. But at the, at the end of the day, that's that's what I am. You know, that's where I was born. So how can we transform that into being more Catholic? And I think that's the sentiment that they were probably trying to yeah, get across. Absolutely. absolutely. Um, so what about the Irish? How did you, did you come across in your research, maybe like how they celebrated St. Patrick's Day or um, special yeah, not stuff that, they did? Not at this um, this stage. I'm sure they did, though. And there was a, a, an Irish college in Rome as well as an English college. So I, I think that would have been quite an important center. Uh, the, the rector, Monsignor Kirby, he was certainly involved in the whole recruitment, both in 1860 and, and for the Zouaves. So I'm sure they would have gone there perhaps for, for a mass. Okay, so unfortunately we know what happened at the end. Uh, we were not victorious. Uh, the Papal States fell on September 20th, 1870. Um, and after that, the, the Irish and English and the rest of the... Um, foreign papal zouaves and the rest of the foreigners and the papal army were deported. So what was life like for the English and Irish papal zouaves after the conflict ended? Well, most of my research was on the, the English. Um, I mean, they, they, some of them traveled back uh, across lands, but many uh, caught a steamer, a steamship that took them back to, to Liverpool. And in fact, the Canadians, uh, many of the Canadians went with them. Um, and then they caught a separate ship back to, back to Canada and there was a, a sort of a bit of a welcome in Liverpool uh, and and the more wealthy, the more um, upper class Zouaves were all entertained at a very posh hotel, the Adelphi Hotel. Um, I think some of the poorer Zouaves would have kind of lodged with Catholic families in the area. Um, the Papal Defence Committee helped them with with any expenses. You know, I mean, these, these guys kind of had been through quite a traumatic experience after the fall of Rome. They had briefly been prisoners of war effectively um they wouldn't have had much money with them um they probably only had one set of clothing you know they probably arrived back in liverpool in quite a bad state both mentally and physically and and, and would have looked a bit of a mess um so these various committees and groups were there to help them and to get them back home safely 
but then they sort of um they disperse to some extent that there's no uh, veteran association as there was in Holland and, and elsewhere um there was a, a brief attempt there was an organization called the League of Saint Sebastian which was uh, uh, founded by some of the former zouaves and they kind of spoke about uh, keeping on sending petitions of support to the Holy Father, having masses for those Zouaves who had died, you know, remembering Mentana and the other great anniversaries, Julian Watts Russell and Alfred Collingridge, and fighting not so much with the sword, but with the pen. So yes. writing articles um, in favour of the temporal power. And of course, there was a there was a real hope into the 20th century that the Pope would, in some way, regain back some of his um, sovereignty. And of course, you know, it only really uh, is sorted out in 1929 with the, the Lateran Treaty when the Vatican City State is founded. But there were hopes that something a bit more than that would have possible would have, would have been possible. Um, so the League of Sebastian exists into the um, 1880s, but then it fizzles out. And many of the Zouaves go on to, you know, be quite distinguished in their field. Um, they enter the, the various professions, you know, quite a few lawyers, um, one or two uh, aristocrats who have to look after their estates, um, a few soldiers, one or two become priests, uh, although not as many as, say, the French and the Belgians. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, that the last die in the 1930s and uh, are kind of even up until then, they talk about their experiences. Uh, George Collingridge, who is the brother of Alfred Collingridge, he, he uh, goes to Australia um, one of the few Australian Zouave connections, and he becomes a very important artist um, and also writes a, a history book about uh, the discovery of Australia um, and, and the early history of Australia. Um, as it happens, I mean, one of the great things about my writing my book, research my book, was getting in touch with the descendants of Zouaves, uh, partly through the, the internet, um, and I got in touch with several members of the Collingridge family. And about only today, I got an email from one of the, um, I guess, great, great granddaughters uh, of of, uh, of Alfred and George Collingridge. So it's, it's a real honor to kind of be in touch with uh, these descendants. That's so great. And that goes into um, why now, like why now is this interest in Papal's Wolves research, like resurging? And it's, because like this is this is the only ability we this this is the only way we we could do it because it was so lost in the 20th century or it was hard to read the history or understand it it's only because of the technology we have today that we were able to unearth a lot of this history and a lot of these facts especially combine them together because again the papal's wolves they were a multinational or international military unit with just everywhere um, so we're able to compile all this great information, all this great knowledge, all these great stories of these heroes and martyrs for the first time and and give them to a wider audience. So, again, that's what we try to do here at Papal's Wav International. Um, again, that's why we're called International. Um, uh, you know, I really hope that um, there's more research into some of the other smaller nation groups. I mean, very little has, has been written about the indigenous Italian Zouaves. You know, a, a large proportion of the Zouaves came from the Papal States. Um, I know we were a bit critical earlier of some of the Italian unit units in the papal army, but, you know, it'd be great to do a, some research on that and find out their stories. Likewise, the Austrian Zouaves or the Spanish Zouaves, um, as well as some of those really tiny little examples. Like there was a, um, a, a Turkish Zouave, wasn't there? And one or two Africans. Yes. Um, some from, the, from, from Asia. Uh, you know, why do they join? What's their story? I think one of them might have been adopted by a Dutch family. I remember Arno, we had a discussion with Arno about that. But um, yeah, it's some of the, there's so many stories to be discovered and to find out. So actually, I, this is really funny. If one of the um, uh, pictures of the English people's wolves and one of the chaplains, uh, it's from a newspaper clipping that I found. I think it's in your book, but uh, mm -hmm. I found the newspaper clipping on it online and actually like, right below that picture it talks about the turkish papal's waf but yeah. how he left the muhammadan religion to fight for the pope so that was really uh, oh. interesting um to see that there um and his name was was dropped too so that was nice to have his mm -hmm. name um but anyway father do you have any closing thoughts uh i mean just to kind of reiterate how important it is to remember the the, 
this whole episode and, and these men and um although our situation is very different now um you know they they teach us to be to be proud of our faith um and and to stand up for it um and and to be to be loyal and true so i think there's a, there's a uh, as well as looking at it from a historical point of view there, there are many lessons that we can learn from them and um it's been a great privilege to be here with you today, uh, Brendan, and um, thanks to everyone for listening, uh, whether it's live or um, at a later point on YouTube. Yes, uh, th thank you so much for coming. And m my closing thoughts would be for everybody that, um, I guess, unfortunately, the papal states fell. But it's like Father said, that after the fact, they picked up the pen. You know, the sword was no longer able to be picked up, but they picked up the pen. And you see this with uh, many of the other papal swaps across the different nations. That's how they continue their counter-revolutionary struggle, because their fight was against the revolution, the capital R revolution that continues up until today. And then, you know, what can we do besides keep their memory alive and preserve their history um, is to pick up where they left off. So that means that we we must not rest we must continue to fight for our our faith um trying to really um really push for christ the king um as pope pius the 11th uh put, was it was pope pius 11th right 1925 uh uh with his encyclical on christ the king um but anyway um that's that's what we need we need to do um Wavs are a great inspiration for that. But um, anyway, thank you all for coming so much. Our ne next live stream will hopefully be in about a month from now. So please stay tuned for updates. Um, but thank you so much for watching. Until next time.